So uh, welcome everyone. I'll be the moderator for this session, uh, which is presentation session 10, Open Air Orchid Ensuring Data Quality. My name is Avin Natia Borg, and I'm from the International Livestock Research Institute based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I'm also a member of the Open Repositories uh, Program Committee. So just a quick reminder, we will put uh, the Open Repositories Code of Conduct in the chat that we expect everyone to follow. We'll have three presentations in this session, each for 15 minutes, and then we'll try to address a few questions after each one of uh, the presentations. So first, I'd like to ask Andrea Boleni from uh, For Science to talk about results from uh, open air call for innovation in rich local data via the open air uh, graph. Over to you, Andrea. I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, thanks, Ahmed. So I'm going to share my screen. Let's go. So hello, is Andrea Bollini from Force Science speaking. I'm glad to report to you about the result of the rich local data via the Open Air Graph project. Among the activities carried on by Open Air Advanced Project, they launched the Open Innovation Program to challenge Adapt and as means in the area of open science via public call. Three topics were offered structured according to the open air architecture. The first topic was related to the data sources, mainly the, report, the repository platform. The second topic was focused on the integration layer the open air research graph, where the data from the previous layer are put together, processed, and transformed in activable information. The last topic is related to the open air service portfolio built on top of this information. The enriched local data via the open air graph project by For Science was targeted to topic two, the integration layer. We aim to turn the information into open air graph in knowledge for the repository. The project has two goals that result in embedded services for the space and the space case repositories. The first service is named data correction and is related to improve the accuracy of existing data in the repository. The second service is named publication claim and is about offering to the repository information about publication that it miss. The project goes through a rigorous process in continuous dialogue with the open air team. Only a selection of successful projects advance from one phase to the next one. In the first phase, we have refined and validated the idea. In the second phase, we have implemented a prototype of the solution, phasing with real implementation issues. In the third phase, we turned the project in a production-ready solution, validated and further refined in a pilot project with the University of Trieste. The project completes successful all the three phases of the open air innovation call, and its result are now included out of box in the Space Chris 7 and available for the plain the Space 7 as pages, with aims to be included in a future version. I will give you now more detail about the two service. We start with the data correction. The Space Chris and, this, and the Space Repository contribute their data to open air via IPMH according to different open air guidelines. Open air get data from thousand sources, other repository, but also founder system and more. This collective data are processed using machine learning and text mining technology to influence and enrich the original data. For instance, combining different representation of the same record in one, that in turn mean enriching the record with missing metadata, relation, or fixing inaccurate data. 
The result of this processing is exposed as events related to the originated record in the open air notification broker. A JSON dump of the events related to the repository can be extracted using the tool noted in the slides provided by the open air technical team and more specifically by the co-author of this presentation at CNR. The solution had a further step. Once that the information came back into the repository, the decision that will be taken over this information is pushed back to open air so that it can be used to validate and improve further the inference and enrichment process. How it look like in the repository? The repository admin has access to an administrative dashboard where all the correction proposed are presented by category. Here you see more than 5,000 persistent identifiers that were found in the open air graph to be added to repository record. Uh, there is also additional category like missing abstract found in open air or relation with the project. Clicking on a specific the administrator uh, can get detail about the suggestion. Here you see a detail about the additional persistent identifier found for the repository record, in such case some DOI. The admin can quickly verify the accuracy of the suggestion, clicking on the DOI as it will be resolved and the publication will open the repository detail page. If the proposed correction is right, it can just accept uh, the suggestion and the metadata of the local record will be amended as needed. A more interesting example is related to missing or additional funding re uh, reference discovered in OpenAir. In this case, the system presents the detail of the funded project as present in the OpenAir graph. And again, the administrator can check more detail accessing the detail page of the funded project on the OpenAir portal, or look into the local detail of the publication in the repository. The project can be imported directly into the repository and linked to the publication, or a local, a local record representing the funding in the repository can be identified so that no duplication occur. This is related to the fact that in this space server and this space Chris funded project can be represented in the repository with its own record. I'm pleased to say that this feature was very well received by the University of Trieste repository manager that partnered with us in the project. The second service is named Publication Claim. The open air research graph contain publication and more research information that are relevant for your institution that can be missing in your repository for several reasons. New researcher join your institution probably have already contributed to the open air graph via their previous institution or your researcher may fail to submit all the publication to the repository. But this information can come from an external co-author of your researcher, or maybe from the funder or another domain repository. So what the system does is to constantly and automatically check the open air graph for you, looking for relevant data that are missing in your repository. In this example, you see that a researcher that logs in into the repository is prompted with information that uh, publication, additional publication has been found in the open air graph about him. So he can just review the suggestion, get the detail of the publication that has been found, and confirm or reject some of this suggestion and get this data immediately imported into the repository. They can be imported in bulk so that they can check more than one publication to be immediately imported, 
or rejected. Of course, the system is not perfect. So uh, there are misattribution of, uh, of publication due to homonymy and uh, other uh, mismatch in the intergraph. For this reason, the researcher can just uh, flag face uh, positive. As you see here, there are also a score about the accuracy of this suggestion. Uh, this score is uh, calculated according to different uh, criteria, such as the, the correctness of the author name in the publication, of the use of different variants of the name, the presence of identifier for the author, so, such as an ORCID, or uh, the, the relevance of the topic of this publication for the research interest of the author, the date of uh, uh, the publication according to uh, the anagraphic detail of, uh, of the researcher. So you are not expected to, to write academic publication when you are a baby or uh, maybe um, too late in your uh, career. These suggestions are also available to the repository manager for the whole repository so that he can also help the researcher to go through all the suggestions and import what is missing. Again, also in this case, the, the feature was found to be very useful. And I'm happy to say that it was a time server for researcher that now can spend more time on their research inside and pulling data multiple times, multiple systems. To summarize the result of the project, we have successfully implemented both the data product that was planned. A project website is available and fully documented. So you can check all the detail about uh, the technical detail and the user experience detail on the project website. The source code is completely free, open source. It's available on GitHub, both for the REST API and the Angular user interface and the documentation of the REST API. All the aspects are automatically tested. So we have automatic testing in place for the backend and the front end according to the community uh, policies. A pilot installation has been performed using real data from a real repository with thousands of researcher, thousands of publication uh, from the University of Trieste. We have an acceptance test uh, plan written specifically for this two data product, and it was verified using the pilot uh, installation. I'm glad to thank the OpenAir team for the support that they give to our project and all the co-author of this publication for the great help and feedback provided across the project. We will be have, uh, available on the Wonder Network session to give, provide you many more information if needed. Uh, please post your question. I will be very happy to answer. And join maybe us in the next session to learn more about the space Chris and other projects where we were involved. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Andre, for the presentation. I don't see any question in the Q&A box, but feel free to post your uh, questions. Um, so next we'll move to the second presentation, which is uh, on ORCID and open air compliance for this space. Uh, for this, I'd like to invite William Roy from, from Queen's University Library, Canada. William, over to you. Thank you, Abinet, and I'm just uh, going to get my screen sharing happening here. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so we'll do this. Oops. Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, and you're seeing the the whole the whole slide there. Just making sure. Yes. 
Excellent. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Will Roy and I work at Queen's University in Canada. It's very early over here in Canada, but I'm still glad to be joining Open Repositories today. Um, we're going to be talking about ORCID and open air compliance for DSpace. And today I'll be speaking on behalf of um, my colleagues and collaborators, Courtney Matthews, Andrea Bolini, uh, Luigi Andrea Pascarelli, Susanna Mornati, Kathleen Shearer, and Pierre Lassou. Uh, and the aim of today is to give you some brief background into a collaboration between Four Science, uh, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, and CORE. And I'm going to talk to you about why we were interested in Canada in connecting our network of repositories to the Open Air Project, uh, what the impetus was for doing that, and where we are today. Uh, as well as how we implemented the four science code into our local repository uh, at Queen's University, which uses DSpace 5.10 um, and how that's gone. So uh, a little bit about where I'm coming from. I work in the library at Queen's, as I mentioned, and uh, the division of the library, which I work on is focused on uh, sharing scholarship as openly as possible for access and reuse. So similar mission to many other research libraries around the globe today. Uh, and we're guided by principles that scholarship should be shared and disseminated as widely as possible for the benefit of society and the advancement of research. And we have strong beliefs that this can be done through open and collaborative tools. Uh, and that that can increase the engagement of researchers who want to regain control of their of their work and the scholarly communications ecosystem. So in terms of ORCID and open air, both of those projects resonated with us due to the fact that they're pursuing a global view towards openness and using open or collaborative researcher focused tools to do that. These kinds of principles are also shared by our colleagues at uh, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. And um, they actually started a couple years ago in 2018, an open repositories working group under the guise of the Advancing Research Committee. And their aims were to connect um, and uh, bring together the repository community in Canada towards a strategic vision which would help us to better meet our goals of making Canadian research outputs open and discoverable and of enabling researchers to comply with funding mandates while also being able to track and monitor our success. Um, so open air made a lot of sense for us and we wanted to look at that very carefully as an option for Canada. Um, I'm sure that many of us on the call are familiar with open air, um, but as, as if you don't know, they also share the similar uh, values towards um, openness and transparency, and they facilitate ways of innovatively connecting and monitoring research, um, which was outlined quite well in Andrea's presentation a moment ago. Um, they do this through aggregating research from various repositories using the OAI PMH protocol for harvesting metadata. Um, and in order to do so, uh, repositories need to follow a very specific uh, metadata application profile, which is documented in the Open Air Guidelines for Literature Repositories uh, Managers version 4. So our group, the Open Repositories Working Group, um, had looked at those requirements and had also been doing some exercises to under, understand the diversity of different repository uh, setups in Canada. Um, and we did a mapping exercise and found that about one third of Canadian institutions were using DSpace, uh, with most of them on versions five and six, and just a, ha a small handful using earlier versions. None of the repositories uh, had the version seven, which makes open air uh, compliance uh, easy out of box. A and a number of, uh, of, of institutions in Canada also identified challenges with implementing some of the technological requirements due to staffing 
or uh, funding and resources. Um, so it didn't seem like we would have an easy time bringing together this vision unless we could do something to collaboratively work towards that goal. What we needed to be able to do uh, was to easily transform our repository's um, standard OAI PMH feed into a usable metadata format compliant with the open air requirements. And some of the challenges included uh, having to transform flat uh, XML structures into nested XML structures, which better indicate the relationships between different uh, discrete metadata items. Having to add new metadata to um, allow for the monitoring of funding information. And one of the key ones was exposing ORCID records via the OAI PMH feed. So all of these changes would be what we had to do in order to uh, become compliant with open air. And we knew we needed some help with that. So this is where um, for science came into the picture. Um, so led by Queens, uh, we had some discussions with a small subset of the open repositories working group and determined that because of the financial uh, or because of the financing situation and staffing situation in many repositories, it would be more feasible uh, to pool resources uh, to make this happen. Um, so the, the libraries who took part in this are listed um, and we decided to hire for science to make these change updates specifically to DSpace versions five and six due to um, how many repositories we had identified in Canada using those particular versions. Um, we also uh, determined that we would move forward with uh, proposing that the patch for ORCID also be a, par a part of this code. So where we are now is that this uh, code has been uh, successfully completed. Uh, the patch is available to the DSpace community for versions uh, five and six. Um, and this allows um, you to expose the necessary metadata elements in the appropriate format to be harvested by uh, open air. Uh, for science has also been doing some updates to the patch and just a few highlights there include now the ability to use ORCID author lookup in not only the XML UI version of DSpace, but also the JSP UI version. They've done some work to remove issues for rebuilding the local cache. Um, as I mentioned, exposing ORCIDs is a part of this um, a part of this uh, development as well. Uh, and you can also collect and expose additional metadata to help link publications with projects. So there's a lot of funding metadata um, that can now be entered into the DSpace user forms as a result of these, uh, these updates. Um, in terms of the ORCID patch, um, I just wanna walk through uh, in a little bit more detail what it does. Um, so for one, um, researchers or librarians using the repository can look up and associate an author with an ORCID using the DSpace input forms. Um, and ORCIDs can be exposed uh, through the DSpace OAI PMH feed. And I will show you what that looks like in a moment. Um, but if, if you're not familiar, uh, the reason why this is so significant is because the way ORCID typically works in DSpace is that it, it consults the external um, a public API for ORCID. Um, and DSpace does not track the ORCIDs within its own internal database and has thus no way of exposing them over the OAI PMH feed. Um, so the patch actually allows for the XSL transform process to add ORCIDs in as an attribute to the data site creator element within um, the exposed OAI PMH feed. And the other thing it does um, is inclusion of the ORCID within the name identifier attribute um, to meet open air's requirements. So just a little example of that. Here is a standard 
um, record being displayed uh, over the OAI PMH feed in our, our repository queue space. And as you can see, the um, creator fields uh, for my name and Courtney Matthews' name are in standard Dublin core creator format. Uh, so a very simple, flat XML representation there. And if I move to the next example, this is what the patch does um, to uh, author names. As you can see, they're now in the data site creator name format, um, and there is nested information within those XML representations that includes the name identifier and ORCID number as an attribute. Um, so that's quite significant uh, if you want to be able to expose this information to aggregators. Um, this get, provides you with a way of doing so. Um, in terms of our results locally at Queen's University, we're quite happy uh, because uh, we wanted to be able to um, help our researchers be discovered in new avenues and open air being a global uh, resource that's uh, well known all across Europe. Um, we're quite happy to see that um, over 15,000 of our records have successfully made their way into Open Air Explore. I've also included uh, within this slide just a, a small screenshot of um, a bar chart, or, or sorry, a pie chart um, that comes from uh, the statistics, uh, which are part of the enrichments and enhancements that um, you get as a participating repository supplying data to open air. So we can now get some insights into uh, the different funders that have, um, that have supported the research within our repository. And as you can see, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada uh, obviously funds quite heavily the projects in Canada and other Canadian funders, as well as some European funders are represented within that chart. So that's very useful and insightful to have that extra information for us. In terms of how this uh, has impacted the Open Repository Working Group's uh, overall uh, aims, um, it has helped to inform um, them going forward, and they are in the midst of creating a Canadian portal uh, in collaboration with Open Air, who are providing an aggregator as a service, uh, which will allow uh, us to collect publications originating from Canada using um, feeds such as Crossref, PubMed, and other publisher data sources. Uh, but it will also allow, uh, as was our original mission, to uh, showcase the content coming out of Canadian repositories. Now, some repositories will use this for science patch, whereas others may pursue other, um, other venues for, for making that happen. Um, but overall, we're going to have a very uh, robust, um, useful platform for showcasing Canadian research. And it's also going to include uh, portages uh, which is our national data repositories um, representation of, of, of data within that platform, as well as um, uh, content from Canadian journals, uh, such as the Open Journal Systems uh, data and the uh, large social sciences and humanities um, database, Erudite. Um, just a few more things if you are interested uh, in this patch, the documentation links are here, as well as the complete code for versions five and version six. Um, I've been asked to convey that version five is in review pending status. Um, and this is likely due to the fact that uh, the DSpace community is largely focused on DSpace seven at the moment. Um, and the code for version six is being merged uh, into the six, or has been merged into the 6X maintenance branch and will be part of the 6.4 release. Um, so only minor configuration changes within version six will be needed to enable the open air literature context in your repository. Um, my colleagues' uh, contacts are listed on the slide um, and I'd be glad to take any questions now.
thanks a lot. Um, what you're doing is very interesting indeed. Uh, I don't see any questions so far. Um, I assume the presentation is uh, clear. Um, so now let's move to the final uh, presentation, which is on how to ensure good data quality assurance by research data uh, repositories. For this, we have uh, Maxi and Dorothea from Berlin School of uh, Library and Information Science. Over to you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Dorothea Strecker, and uh, together with my colleague Maxi, I will um, present our work at Re3 Data CoREF on uh, data quality assurance. Um, I will first um, provide a brief introduction into Re3 Data the service, as well as the project Re3, Re3, Re3 Data CoREF, uh, before handing over to Maxi, who will um, give you an overview of our work on data quality, presenting uh, preliminary results of a survey among repository operators we conducted, and uh, she will also give you um, a quick outlook and a conclusion. B3 Data is a global registry that currently index, indexes over 2,600 data repositories from all academic disciplines. By allowing users to find repositories and similar services, B3 Data promotes a culture of data sharing and increased access to and visibility of data sets. The service launched in 2012 and has grown a lot since, as you can see here. At the core of Re3 data are comprehensive descriptions of data repositories. These descriptions are based on the Re3 data metadata schema, which covers various aspects of data repositories. We also offer an icon system that allows users to see some of the most important characteristics at first glance. Funded by the German Research Foundation, the project Re3 Data Coref aims at increasing Re3 Data's values for all stakeholders and at further establishing the service as a tool to, for finding and referencing data repositories. Within the project, we are, for example, um, currently revising the Re3 Data metadata schema. Um, we would also like to take this opportunity to thank the repository community for giving us over 150 comments in our request for comments on uh, version 3.1. Um, this is a tr tremendous help for us and we will definitely um, take that valuable feedback into account. Um, Read through data metadata will also be mapped to schema arc and an RDF implementation is planned. We are also very interested to um, update the Re3 data service models. We talked to several stakeholders to identify relevant use cases. Re3 data's core service of uh, repository discovery, for example, reusing or administering the Re3 data metadata. Uh, we will address all of these use cases in our new service model. Um, I will now hand over to Maxi, um, who will present our work in the area of research data quality assurance. Thanks very much, Doro. So we are making some efforts on uh, ensuring data quality at research data repositories, and we try to uh, increase the visibility of all activities around quality management of data repositories. And therefore we conducted some studies uh, I'm going to present to you in one of the next slides. And for this, we used a multi-method empirical research um, and we are also planning to revise the metadata element quality management um, that we have now on the metadata schema. And we plan to revise it based on the findings. So to plan our research, one of our first questions was, so what can we actually know about data quality and quality assurance and data sharing? From a library and information science perspective, we identified several subjects of research. 
And three of them can be found on this slide here, roughly presenting the research design. One of the studies we conducted was the data journal guideline analysis. We created a sample of 142 data journals and 173 guidelines of those journals. And we collected metadata on the data journals and also conducted a qualitative content analysis of the guidelines. We examined, for instance, quality criteria for data papers and corresponding data sets, as well as repository recommendations mentioned in the guidelines. The second study I did for my PhD work was a qualitative da data analysis of the Core Trust Seal self-description documents. And I used a sample of 99 documents from the certification period uh, 2017 to 2019 for this. I analyzed uh, selected document sections focusing on data quality. And the result of this uh, is a framework for quality management at research data repositories. And based on this previous research, in a third step, we prepared a survey on data quality management at research data repositories. And we will now have a closer look at this survey. The survey addresses repository staff responsible for data curation. It collects information about repository characteristics, about formal assessment of data quality, data curation, data review, data evaluation by repository users and indicators of data quality. The questionnaire all in all comprises 24 questions. I would like to make one important remark here. So we recognize that approaches to and the majority of quality assurance measures are very diverse and may not be relevant or even affordable for all research data repositories. We conducted pre-tests in April and May and again, many thanks to all colleagues that participated in the pretests. The sample was created from a mailing list of more than 1,800 contacts of repositories that we indexed in Retrie data. And all contacts received an individualized online survey we implemented using the tool Lime survey. We linked a document providing an overview on the survey on this slide for you. We started the survey on 18th of May, and we uh, currently extended the deadline until uh, 14th of June. And so far more than 300 repositories participated. So we think this is a good response rate. And again, we would like to use this opportunity to thank all of you that have been participated so far. This is a great help for us. And also sorry for those uh, that have been bothered by us. Um, we will start the data analysis after 14th of June, and the results of the survey will be shared with the community, uh, of course, and data will be shared, of course, as well, but a little later since this is part of my PhD work. But of course, we would like to share with you a short insight into the preliminary data. In one of the first questions, we asked for the types of support the repositories are offering to their data depositors. So please be aware that most questions allow multiple answers. With 228, more than two thirds of the repositories offer direct support from repository staff. 194 repositories indicated both, so providing data format recommendations as well as data deposit guidelines. One third of the respondents, um, 102, indicated that metadata creation is done by repository staff. We also find 85 repositories mentioning data quality checklists, which is, from our point of view, a very interesting subject of follow up studies concerning data quality yes. issues and quality criteria. Yeah, but I just had a, had a panic attack that my. <laughs> okay. Raham, you're not muted. Okay, I think I can go on. Um, that, that gives you some time to look at the graph. So, and of course, we know that the results of this question and most of the other questions are heavily depending on the type of repository, on its scope and data types. And therefore we had an introductory question dealing with this issue. 
And we will also analyze the results matching the survey data with the RISRI data metadata information of the participating repositories. So we will distinguish repository types, for instance, in the analysis. But for today and with regard to the time we have for the presentation, we decided to prepare a general overview on the results. Another question addressed whether formal criteria are applied to data before publication. And with a number of 198 repositories, significantly more than half of the repositories indicated that there are formal criteria applied before data is published. 57 indicated that no formal criteria are applied. The survey contains a follow-up matrix question on formal criteria in detail and on who is responsible for data assessment and curation of those formal criteria. But this is much too complex to be shown in one slide here, but will be analyzed and shared with you as well, of course. One of our favorite questions is on the data review beyond assessment and application of formal criteria. So the question deals with scientific quality um, that can include formal criteria, such as technical criteria, yeah. but rather often corresponds to the scientific value, reusability, and for instance, the appropriateness of methods. 99 repositories stated that all data sets are reviewed. 65 indicated that certain data sets are reviewed. So all in all, this means we have more than a half of the participating repositories that offer some kind of data review, which we found to be quite interesting. One of the follow-up questions addressed the responsibility for data review. And here we can clearly see that for the 164 repositories conducting data review, mainly repository staff and subject experts at the hosting institution of the repositories are concerned with data review. 30 repositories indicated that subject experts from external institutions are engaged in data review. Of course, the survey includes much more questions on data review that will be analyzed soon. And one last insight into the pre preliminary results before we co come to an end. We asked about the types of quality indicators that are made public to data users. And as you can see in this graph, links to corresponding publications and data versioning are the ones chosen mostly. 213 indicated links to publications, 156 indicated data versioning. And as you can see, we use the broad understanding of quality indicators here. And I would like to make a remark on this. So some indicators um, are not necessarily indicators of quality, but can be used for quality evaluation. And also most of these practices were mentioned in the CTS documents. And as I said, this was kind of a basis for um, creating survey. A surprisingly high number of 50 indicated to use quality badges, which is a very interesting follow-up subject of research, at least I think. And as mentioned before, we will start the analysis of the final data set soon and share our results. Our starting point was that we do have little systematic knowledge and data on data quality assurance of uh, sharing data in repositories. And we hope to go one step forward with these studies and especially with the survey results. Not surprisingly, we identified many follow-up subjects of research and open questions already now. One important uh, conclusion is that research data repositories can play a significant role in research data quality assurance, and probably much more than we assumed before. And we learn from the research we have done, but also in exchange with experts, uh, for instance, in pretests, that there is a need to increase the visibility of quality management processes at repositories, and especially with regards to the engagement of data creation and research data management experts. Quality management at, at repositories is a concept that includes many different processes and activities. And so to make it short, it's as much complex and multidimensional as the concept of quality is. 
and the complexity of the topic cannot emphasized often enough. We are aware that the survey for pragmatic reasons has a certain focus on a specific range of activities in this field. Rizvi Data Korov uh, plans to propose kind of a soft description or vocabulary for a more sophisticated quality management property, um, probably in the next version of the metadata schema, which is 4.0, as Doro already mentioned. And Rizvi Data also plans follow up activities and would head for cooperation with other initiatives such as CORE and others. And with this, we would like to thank you for your attention. We are happy about your questions and um, please get in contact if we can help with any questions. Um, thanks, uh, Paul. Uh, this, this was a very interesting uh, presentation. There is one question for you regarding uh, read 3 data. Some institutional research repositories focus on multiple use cases, for example, open access repository or CRIS functionality as well. How can or how should this be uh, registered in the uh, read 3 data? The same question applies to open DOAR as well. You're muted. Um, I'm going to try and answer this. Um, as far as read to data is concerned, we have a, um, an editorial policy that states that repositories with a focus on research data uh, can be listed, um, but doesn't, that doesn't have to be um, the single focus um, of a repository. What we, um, I think what we would like to see in the future is to have increased interoperability between read three data and other registries. Um, so for example, by ways of identifiers, um, so that repositories can be described by various registries, but um, these descriptions can still be unified in some way. But um, we do cover um, these multifaceted repositories in read three data. Anything you'd like to uh, add, Maxi? I assume uh, no. So uh, I don't see any other uh, question in the chat, in the Q&A. Oh, there comes another one. Okay, uh, that's just a comment. So I guess uh, that's all we have for uh, this session. Uh, thank you again very much all our uh, presenters and everyone who has uh, joined. Thanks to our sponsors as well, without which this could not have been possible. In the next uh, 10 minutes, you can join 24 seven session four or presentation session 11 on this space, Chris, a DSpace 7 submission workflow and configurable uh, entities. Uh, thanks again uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. And um, Abinet, if you want to stop sharing, I can share the, the slides for the the opening slides for the next session. Okay, sure. And uh, if people have uh, further questions, we can you can put them into the um, chat document or the question Q and A document, which is linked from SCED and should be in the chat as well. There, so feel free to follow up.
we have 10 minutes left before the next session. It'd be nice to start early, but I guess we can't do that. So we'll just take a break, go and get yourself a cup of tea. If you're intending to stay here, there's another session over in room one, we're in room two. Um, this is going to be the 24 seven session four, starting in uh, 10 minutes. So can you keep the commentary and banter going for 10 minutes, Catherine? I can definitely not do that. I'll, I'll have to leave that up to you. While we're waiting, I suppose I could thank our sponsors again. Um, so you'll, you'll see them mentioned throughout the, the conference presentations. Um, they're also here with us, uh, involved in all aspects of the conference. They are presenting and they are involved in, in various different tracks and they're at the networking sessions. So later on today, we will have a net, another networking session. I think it's at 12 o'clock UTC. And that's your chance to go and ask questions of the sponsors. So I'd encourage people to, to go in there. You can, you can just chat to people generally, but you're also able to go and, and maybe ask some questions of the sponsors. So it looks like you've got some sunshine over there, Catherine. Coming our way. I don't know, we might keep it. It's <laughs> actually it's lovely. We've had some great weather this last while. Yeah. In Cardiff is grey and slightly damp. Right. Oh. Hello, Catherine. Would there be any chance to do a quick uh, screen share test? Sure. Actually, yeah. If people want to do that, I'll stop sharing. And anybody who wants to test their own sh screen share, go ahead. Okay. So I'll do uh, I'll do mine right now. So I share my entire screen. Switch over and do you now see the the slide full screen? Yeah. We do. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Super. Would anybody else like to try screen sharing if you haven't? Yes. So you should see the full screen. I do indeed, yes. OK, thanks. Ask me five more minutes. Um, I think we have two speakers not here yet.
Uh, Moni is here. If you would like to try your screen share, please feel free. We have a few more minutes before we start. I'll just stop sharing. If you want to do that, let me know. Uh, yeah, that'll be great. Thank you. Test it out. I just want to check the recording as well. Hello, my name is Perfect. Moni Chowdhury and I am the data science. Yep, yeah, that works. Thank you. Great. The amount of time that is saved for each person walking up to the stage, uh, unclicking and clicking in their own laptops and everything. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, interesting it, format. It, 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 it works until, until somebody has problems sharing their screen and then you can lose so much time of people trying to get this to work. So, or the classic talk present without only being there then. Just check the time. Okay, we're getting close to time. Okay, um, that's pretty much time. So we'll make a start. Uh, welcome to the fourth and last, I think, 24 uh, seven session at OR 2021. Uh, I'm Catherine Cassidy. I'm with the Digital Repository of Ireland and I'm also on the Open Repository Steering Committee. Um, so here we are, this is our session. Um, we have, I'd just like to remind everybody that we have a, a code of conduct for open repositories. And the link is there at the top. And of course, the, the OR community are wonderful people and there's, there haven't been any, any kind of issues. But if you do witness any behavior that you don't think is appropriate, or if you experience any, do go, go check out the code of conduct. There are email addresses you can contact there, or you can contact the hosts of any of the, the sessions. Um, our sessions are being recorded. Everything will be up on Zenodo and we're live streaming on YouTube. So, so uh, everything is being made available. And there is a, a shared document which you can take notes in. Uh, I'll post the link to that in the chat shortly. And then we'll get started. So first up, we have Moni Chaudhry. You can share, start setting up your screen sharing, Moni. Actually, I better stop sharing mine, I suppose. Great. So Moni is with the uh, University of Edinburgh and she's involved in the Respire project, which is bringing together uh, institutes in Bangladesh, India, Malaysia, Pakistan, working on seamless depositing solutions for multi low middle income countries, uh, qualitative data. So ready made or tailor made. Go ahead, Moni.
the sharing has stopped there. So try again. Hello, my name is Moni Chowdhury and I am the Data Science and Methodology Manager for RISPIRE. RISPIRE is a National Institute for Health Research Global Health Research Unit on Respiratory Health based at the University of Edinburgh. Participating organisations include academia, research centres and disease specific institutes. The primary purpose of RISPIRE is to identify and tackle some of the biggest causes of illness and death and respiratory diseases in the South Asia region. There are 40 plus projects within the RISPIRE collaborations, which include fully embedded as well as standalone PhDs and research fellowships. The research methodologies adopted are heterogeneous. One of the deliverables of RISPIRE is to deposit research data in an open source repository. And the role of RISPIRE supporting um, program on methodology and data science is maximizing the uses that research data can be put in safe and secure ways. This will be achieved by complying with all applicable laws um, relating to the collection, storage and use, uh, as well as privacy of any data relating to and which can be used to identify a person. To support RISPIRE researchers, we needed to establish if all data can be deposited into one open data repository and be aware of the barriers and challenges this could potentially bring, particularly for qualitative data. Please note the following presentation is not fully representative of all the challenges and barriers, um, but a small sample of those identified by our qualitative researchers. We started by looking at what policies on data sharing and data management exist. Um, so on the left is the one for the funder, which is the data position on data sharing, and on the right is the data management policy from the sponsor at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I don't have any examples from the lower middle income countries, but I am aware that there are some that exist in India. Where policies don't exist, um, there are some contextual challenges, particularly around um, data management being relatively new for some of the RISPIRE research team. Uh, data management training may have been limited to data management teams previously, um, and a whole system approach for low and middle income country data management and implementation is required right at the starting point or even earlier. Um, so a retrospective review of the research project data highlighted that the variety of methods, um, so some of those are on the screen, um, uh, also reflect the variety of the data collection undertaken, the research settings where the data was collected, and thereby the methodologies adopted. Around half the number of projects were already underway or about to start when I came into BOSE. Discussion with the research teams around depositing their data set for potential sharing highlighted some very specific challenges. So what constitutes the data, um, the types of outputs from the data collected, how, would, how could you de-identify the data, the resources that are required locally, um, what are the knowledge and skills within the teams and does that add additional time and cost? To support RISPIRE research projects data to be deposited into a suitable repository, I explored the re3data.org for existing and available repositories, applying a number of search terms. But most of the results were not relevant because they are not con they are because they are country or region specific and the topic is not related to respiratory health specifically. Um, therefore, no relevant discipline specific repository was found. Um, and this was last undertaken and checked in November 2019. Um, in addition to the searches on the re3data.org for subject specific repositories, we also considered repositories data archives at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and remote discussions were had with um, sister uh, organisations um, at the University of York, as well as the in-depth network iShare, um, who 
which is um, led by our, one of our partners in India, uh, the UK Data Service, and um, discussions with the Wellcome Trust as well. Um, and in discussions with colleagues at the University of Edinburgh's Research Data Service, um, confirmed that the repository of choice should get indexed by Google Scholar and optimised to be picked up by Google Dataset Search 2, as well as allow unique identifiers to be attached to individual datasets to allow for findability and appropriate data citation. Um, so Edinburgh Data Share um, on the left, um, it is an open access repository. It will assist researchers who want to share their data, get credit for their data and preserve their data for long term and comply with um, funder requirements to preserve and share their data. Uh, this particular deposit uh, within Edinburgh DataShare, which is on the left, has been picked up by Google Dataset, which is on the top right. And the standalone metadata, which is on the bottom right, and was deposited into the Health Data Research Innovation Gateway, has also been picked up by Google Dataset. Uh, what this um, screen doesn't show is the usage statistics on Edinburgh DataShare uh, for this embargoed dataset. Uh, which is cr creating interest from around the world. So some of the concerns highlighted from our partners on openly sharing qualitative research data, um, there would be no tracking of individuals viewing or accessing the data set, some potential misuse of the data and no acknowledgement for data reuse and um, it not being suitable for sensitive data deposit, although all of these are not unique to low, middle income countries or even qualitative data. But these concerns are, are real, um, especially because data depositing activities are relatively new for um, our partners and the local resources are limited. Um, so to overcome the fears, uh, and challenges of depositing qualitative data in an open repository, an alternative solution was presented, that of Edinburgh's standalone closed archive of data vaults. This will help respire researchers um, to submit data sets for more controlled or managed access, where they are in control of who to share their data with once um, access is requested. This is also an ideal place for slightly more sensitive types of qualitative data. Like Edinburgh Data Share, the Edinburgh Data Vault data sets are not visible, but metadata about the data set are available uh, through a PR record on the Edinburgh Research Explorer, like the example here. Uh, this particular example is, illustrates what has been deposited into the data vault and the access requirements, um, such as through a data sharing agreement. These are some of the concerns raised by the researchers, um, um, but I do want to add that the cost is already covered by the sponsor for the Respire deposits. Some of the recommendations to challenges, um, capacity building of the local research teams to ensure equity of importance is attached to both quantitative and qualitative research data management. Availability or development of internationally recognised guidance or consensus for qualitative research data management um, to safely share this type of data for countries to adopt or adapt to local context and to share data according to ethics and consent. And there's a couple That's of cool. examples. Hey, Moni, maybe we could cut it off there. And, and you based on the various discussions between Respire and both in the UK and the yeah, lower middle income countries um, in South Asia um, highlighted the complexities and challenges in depositing qualitative um, data openly. Uh, while screening data could remove identifiers, researchers are concerned that the significance behind what participants said could be lost and affect the rigour of the data. The increasing movement by funders or sp and sponsors towards data depositing into open access repositories is allowing the researchers to think about uh, responsible data sharing uh, and how that can be achieved amidst the challenges um, like national and international regulations and the confidentiality issues. 
Our proposed solution is through controlled or managed access, which we have explored and explained earlier, especially if the data is deemed sensitive and or has a small population or sample size. And here I will end. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Moni. Um, so while you're switching over there, Paul, you're next. So Paul Stokes uh, is with JISC, an organization that doesn't really need any uh, introduction, I think, but Paul leads on preservation for JISC's preservation service. And he's going to, I hope, answer the question, would auto-translation of metadata enhance discovery and impact of research data? Take it away. Okay, I trust you, you can see my screen. So, so would auto-translation of metadata enhance discovery um, or would it make it worse? Um, before I start, I put this 24-7 proposal uh, in before I was aware of the ideas challenge from last year. And after I saw the presentation from the challenge team on Tuesday, I scrapped my original presentation and rewrote it, hopefully in a way that meshes in with their project. So let's get on with some background. Tomás et al. set the scene very nicely with a plethora of arguments in favour of linguistic diversity and the problems associated with providing access to the dominant English content for non-English speakers and vice versa. I think that they potentially missed a trick, though. <clears throat> in my opinion, it's not just a matter of missed opportunities for enrichment and cultural diversity, for wouldn't it be nice if, or we should because it's the right thing to do. We must do it. Why? Well, let me give you an example. In August 2004, it was reported in Nature that some potentially significant and alarming data relating to the cross-species transmission of the bird flu virus known as H5N1 over to pigs in 2003 had been overlooked because it was published in Chinese language journals. Uh, the data was important because although transmission from bird to human is unlikely, trans transmission of flu-like viruses from pigs to humans is a much more common occurrence. It indicated that the chances of a potential pandemic scenario evolving was much more likely. The findings only became more widely known by chance to, amongst others, the World Health Organization and the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, when one of the authors of the papers involved presented at an international symposium on the prevention and control of SARS and avian influenza. If that author had not presented, then the data may never have become more widely known. This type of scenario happens all too frequently, and the next time we may not be so lucky, something we can ill afford in the light of current circumstance. At the crux of the problem is the use of the discovery and scholarly commons infrastructure. A research outputs published in English have a relatively mature discovery infrastructure based upon mature standards and ontologies formulated in English that facilitate discovery and reuse, as long as the authors include the appropriate metadata following those standards, of course. Obviously, research communities publishing in languages apart from English also have metadata standards and discovery infrastructures. The problem lies at the interface between those infrastructures. How can you overcome the language barrier? In an ideal world, all content would be available in all languages. That's not going to happen. Clearly, having professional linguistics, uh, linguists translating all research outputs into every language is totally impractical. But what about just the metadata and or abstracts? A lesser burden, but still a lot of work. Tomash pointed out one innovative route using the crowdsourced translation of keywords through querying Wikidata and DPpedia. This approach provides relatively high quality translation, but as Tomash pointed out, it's limited by the number of language sets available. So when I first started considering this problem, I had a few key features in mind. It had to support as many languages as possible and translation from any language to any other language. It had to have minimal to no impact on depositor workflow. It needed to be scalable it needed to be applicable to many different types of research object. And I didn't want to reinvent the wheel or undertake a lot of betterment work, as my programming skills are very rusty. Uh, I wanted to enhance discoverability and impact and definitely not make things worse. It seemed to me obvious from the outset that one possible way forward would be the use of auto translation tools. Uh, these tools have become ubiquitous and considerably more effective in the past decade. Underpinned by AI, many, many petabytes of test data and contextual enhancement, auto-translation is no longer the fourth or fifth rate alternative to human translation in many scenarios. Words, short passages, and in some cases, multiple page documents are now being translated with relatively good results. At present, translation of a complex, nuanced, scholarly work is still probably not a good idea. But the auto-translation of keywords, metadata, and potentially abstracts, to allow scholarly communication across the language barriers seems to be eminently practical. Automatically tagging 
bird flu as la grippe aviaire and vice versa is relatively simple. And what's more, the commonly available translation tools, Google, etc., all have APIs that allow for both language detection and translation between more than 100 languages. I quite rapidly discarded the concept of auto-translating auto the body of a paper or the contents of data sets. There is simply too much inbuilt complexity, uh, tables, pictures, graphs, and embedded domain knowledge in a body of a typical paper or data set to make it practical. However, titles, keywords, and other metadata fragments should translate relatively well. I hesitated when considering abstracts, but ultimately came down on the side of including them. On the whole, they tend to be relatively short and text only. So this gives a core translation requirement of the following, the title, a subject, potentially multiple entries here, and description, again, potentially multiple, multiple entries. The next question I considered was when any auto translation should take place. Uh, in order to maximize any multilingual impact, the translated elements need to be available from the point of deposit before any discovery of harvesting has taken place. Hence, it has to be built into the deposit workflow. So this gives a simplistic workflow as follows. Initiate the deposit, and for each language, send a title, subject, and descriptions to the translation API, embed the return translated me metadata, repeat for all languages you're going to translate, and then complete the deposit. So this meets the first five of my criteria, at least on paper. And talking about on paper, I've got access to a demo repository. So I had a little play. My programming skills are, are the best part of 30 years out of date. And the DevOps team quite sensibly don't want me playing around with their carefully crafted code. So I simulated the under the bonnet stuff with a little manual jiggery pokery. I started with this and ended up with this. Only long one, one language, Welsh in this case, if you're interested, and I know it's neither pretty nor complete. It's what we used to call a, a fast and nasty. So what next? There's the unanswered question, does this method enhance discoverability and impact? Sorry, Catherine. Uh, I think it would, but I haven't yet had, got the evidence. Um, taking the paper-based proof of concept model and building into a proper repository should help with that. And I'm working on my persuasion skills around that part. A pilot project along with related analysis should answer the question. There are also the unanswered questions of what to do with the existing corpus of research. This approach proposed would provide a solution for new deposits, but how could we backfill the missing languages of historic deposits, whilst at the same time ensuring that our additions get incorporated into the discovery systems? And how should we approach the inevitable need to translate the body of the research objects at some point? Short answer is, I don't know. So to sum up, I know this proposed methodology is probably not a good long-term solution, but is it good enough for now? Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, so posing the question then is, is still the first, important first step. So as we switch over, next up we have Tamsin Berland. Uh, Tamsin is also with JISC, but her focus is on open research services and uh, you can share your screen there. Yeah, so she's, this is a really interesting sounding presentation kind of sounds a bit magic, interoperability as a service. Off you go. You're muted, Tamsin, if you're speaking. There we go. And we'll put the video on as well. Okay, let's start again. All right, I'm going to talk about providing, or well, the possibility of providing interoperability as a service. Okay, I'm not advancing, there we go. Um, so many of you will be aware of um, the, the GISC ran a project, um, creating a, a research data shared service for institutions in, in the UK. Um, we gathered requirements from over 70 universities and we distilled them into three main components. So that's uh, repository functionality, uh, digital preservation and interoperability between the services and systems involved. So to start with, we built a canonical data model for the service. We used the main scholarly comms metadata standards of data site, Crossref, Serif, Dublin Core, Ethos, etc. Um, and it's extensible, so we can add as many content types to that model um, as, and we can also map the metadata to those of other services to facilitate the interoperability. 
Uh, then we built the core infrastructure, which is a database and an object store, which is cloud hosted on AWS, and it's ISO 27001 certified. Next, we built a repository front end. So this is a multi-content, multi-tenancy, new generation repository, which meets all the mandatory requirements of Plan S, um, and it displays new generation repository behaviors. And as you'd expect, the repository infrastructure exposes the metadata for discovery and interacts with um, scholarly comms APIs. We also needed to provide dig digital preservation as part of the service. So we teamed up with Artifactual, who provide Archivematica, and also with Preservica to provide a choice of fully managed and hosted preservation services. However, one of our requirements was specifically for interoperability between systems. So to solve the interoperability issue, we built a publish subscribe messaging service, which is based on the canonical data model. And this messaging service permits the collection of metadata and digital files from one service, and then um, facilitates the ingest of that material into a, a second service via our service um, core infrastructure. So to connect up these services, we need to build service adapters. So in the case of digital preservation, we've built one for Preservica and one for Archivematica. And using these adapters, we can deposit the uh, metadata in the, and the files in the repository front end. And when they're published, they'll automatically go via the core infrastructure and be ingested into the preservation service of choice without any further intervention. However, some institutions want to deposit their data via other repositories um, that they have or via their CRIS systems. So we've also built service adapters um, so far for uh, Pure, Converis, ePrints, DSpace and Haplo. And these adapters would also um, allow deposit from CRIS systems or other repositories into our repository. So what we've built is a highly interoperable research outputs ecosystem with different components sharing a common infrastructure. So we offer a range of packages using this infrastructure and the only common um, item in this offer is our infrastructure. So we've ended up building an interoperability service without realizing it. So now we're offering it as a service in its own right, along with, uh, the, with the current service adapters that we've built and we can build other service adapters as well. And we're calling it Research Systems Connect. So the thing is with research systems is there's a lot more to research and research services than just a CRIS, a repository and a preservation system. So this slide um, is from Edinburgh Napier University, and it shows the system functionality and, and the different uh, components required for uh, research management within a typical UK university. So it's not exhaustive. Not all universities have a CRIS. Um, sometimes things like ethics and impact and REF and research grants are all in different systems. The other thing you can see from this, this map is that there's a lot of point-to-point -point integration going on. And sometimes for universities, it's not possible to link up the systems at all. So if we were gonna look at this and see how our service could help out, you can see that it only goes so far in helping um, the research data, uh, research uh, information management ecosystem as a whole. Um, obviously, the preservation is not on there, but it's still pretty limited in scope at the moment. So let's look at it another way. So this is our North Star. This is what we could link into. It's not exhaustive again. It's just what came to mind when I was making the slide and also taking information from the, the Ed Edinburgh Napier slide. Um, in green is what we can link to fully already. Uh, orange is underway or planned. So you might notice uh, publishers there, um, that's uh, via um, integrating our GIST service publications router that takes digital files and metadata from publishers and delivers it into uh, quiz systems and repositories. 
So what do we need? So everything in white here is aspirational. So what do we need to make it happen? Well, we need common standards and vocabulary, as if you didn't know, if we're going to build these content models and service adapters for different content types. We believe persistent identifiers are key for metadata exchange, and we're trying, we're looking to build a single end, a, API endpoint for the service that will query multiple um, uh, peer registries. We also need common policies and protocols and workflows. And we need the people with the capabilities to do this and to work together to um, figure this all out. So it's a tall ask, but we're looking to knock off one white circle at a time. So if you're interested in using our service, get in touch. We'd be really happy to talk to any of you who could use it right away. But we'd also really like to talk to anybody who's interesting, interested in developing functionality uh, further functionality is indicated in the slide. And that's me done. That's great, just on time. Thank you very much, Townsend. So next up, we have uh, Ravi Murugasan, who's from the uh, Oroville repository in India. And Ravi is going to tell us about how a really small organization can still set up and run their own repository in lessons learned to setting up a one person repository. You're not in presentation mode now at the moment. All right, yeah, just turning on my, all right. Great. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Uh, that is a good introduction. Um, so I'm gonna talk about sort of one person repository inspired by the concept of one person library, a screenshot of the repository I administer fairly, you know, plain vanilla ePrints uh, site. What is Oroville? It is, um, it's not a university, it's a, it's a community in um, South India. It's an intentional community established about 50 years back um, and um, also recognized by the government of, government of India. Uh, and um, there, uh, there's been a fair amount of research in Oroville, but um, maybe better word is experiments um, in a number of areas forestation this used to be quite a you know a barren plateau as it was uh, you know, back then and it's now quite a green place there's been a lot of work um, and some publications have have happened along the way some peer-reviewed but a lot of gray literature uh, technical reports project reports and so on and uh, Oroville is uh, quite a popular site for external researchers particularly masters and PhD uh, students. And um, so there are a good number of theses um, and so some peer reviewed publications. There are collaborations going on between Oroville residents and external researchers and universities, both in India and abroad. So, um, so just to show you that uh, it is shows up in Google Scholar now, which is good. Um, so while I, I'm part of a team, a three-person team, uh, but I took on the responsibility for the repository by myself. Uh, um, so I don't have prior experience with any repository application, but I was inclined towards uh, ePrints because I'd worked with a somewhat similar application called Moodle, which some of you might have heard of, which is a common uh, learning platform in uh, universities. Um, so, um, so what I've done is uh, first I advocated for the need to have a proper repository, uh, identified an application for it, installed it, uh, did the foundational work, started depositing items, uh, did what I could to get it uh, covered on Google and started publicizing the repository. But before I go on to those points, I just wanna give an overview of what I've learned. Um, in my experience, uh, installing and maintaining a small ePrint site on a small cloud service is fairly straightforward. Um, and the ePrint's tech mailing list is, is quite nice. Uh, and uh, backups, of course, really important. Um, and uh, at the front end, of course, that's the main thing with develop, you know, subject areas. In our case, we had our, our pretty own, you know, unique list of subject areas considering what, um, 
what kind of work happens in Oracle. Um, and we also have a bunch of items that are available to registered users. So developing a policy around that um, and helping researchers see the value of depositing items, uh, such as the visibility they get online. Um, so in terms of costs, um, I'll, I'll tell you how much we currently spend on it very soon, um, but we're still running on a fairly small server. Um, uh, but I think we need to secure long-term funding. At the moment, we have an annual, you know, from around year to year funding. So what I've done uh, so far is at the, at the outset to make a case for why we need a proper repository. We have, we still, there's still a kind of a Oroville research website, which is a bit, uh, you know, mothballed, but it's still, but it's actually online, but that that's not, that's a hand coded website. It wasn't working out. So, um, but we thought we needed a proper repository, or at least I, I made a case for that, drafted a budget uh, for it. And I, uh, I, uh, chose ePrints seemed to be more suitable for a small cloud server. And I was more comfortable with the technologies behind it. Um, so the, the repository is running on a, on a tiny cloud server and we pay, uh, you know, two and a half euro a month. It seems, uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty cheap. I think uh, we have about 170 items. Of course, it's not like Tons of people are visiting the repository. I'm not really doing much by way of uh, server administration. I find it, I'm not having to do much, but it's something I'm I'm learning. Um, so, yeah, it's it was it was fairly straightforward. The foundational work took some more time in the front end, discussing subject areas, and I was I really wanted to not have to make too many changes to the subject areas after we had imported those to the repository and some changes to the static files, but it's quite a plain vanilla repository otherwise. Um, depositing items, that's of course the long-term work. Uh, we were energized to some, get hold of a lot of theses that had been written by external researchers and we've uh, put them on the repository, but restricted to registered users who are Oravillians. So we can enable that in ePrints by you know, institutional email address for registration. Uh, because we don't hold the copyright for that. But at the same time, we are the subject of those research work. So in a sense, we have some, you know, legitimacy to, uh, to, to have them available to us internally. And um, also now uh, many open access items, which is the, you know, internally authored uh, gray literature or even open access journal papers, um, Google coverage, also happened uh, without much of a, of a hassle. Uh, I submitted the website and it's covered by both Google and Google Scholar, I guess because it's an ePrint site, or maybe Google Scholar likes it. Uh, I didn't do much to get it indexed there, I know. Um, publicizing the repository. So uh, we have internal and intranet and, uh, and stuff. So we shared updates, my team and I, and we invited others to create an account uh, because anyone with an Oroville email address can do that. And the water group of Oroville have uploaded a collection of items by themselves. So it's not entirely a one person repository, which is good. Uh, I've uploaded, I'd say most of the items, but hopefully there will be others joining in. Um, the next steps are of course to continue uploading items. And once we have a good collection of open access items, I'd like to see if we can get it included in open DOAR and securing long-term funding. So uh, yeah, check it out if you're interested and um, thank you for listening. Thanks Ravi, that's really interesting. Um, I'm gonna just introduce the next speaker so you can stop sharing, yeah, we can switch over. So Claudio Cortese is our next speaker. He is a product and project manager at Four Science, who of course are one of our sponsors at Award 2021. So we're really happy to have our sponsors involved in, in all aspects of the, the program and talking to us today. So over to you, Ravi. Okay, thank you. So Claudio. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Uh, the, the Pavia University is one uh, of the oldest uh, universities in the world since it was officially established in 1361. And it owns uh, a huge cultural heritage, uh, which includes uh, books collections, museum pieces, uh, manuscripts, uh, archival materials, music files, scores, and opera librettos. And uh, to start, uh, 
making available on the web at least a part of this uh, great uh, cultural heritage. Uh, in uh, 2004, uh, they started uh, their first implementation of a digital library with the digitization of a group of answered books. But uh, the real quantum leap arrived in 2018 uh, migrating, uh, when they, migrate, uh, they migrated the digital library to uh, the space glam. Uh, the um, open source uh, digital library management system built on top uh, of the space and the space grids. Uh, in this way, uh, they uh, uh, have been able to manage also uh, some digital collection that uh, couldn't have been included in the first release of the digital library due to uh, differences in metadata standards and in their data model. Uh, instead, now uh, Pavia University patrimony can be explored and enjoyed in an integrated way, although the differences in the data model and in the metadata standards which uh, affect uh, the um, resources related to the different domains of cultural heritage, mainly uh, archives, libraries, and museums. Uh, in this way, um, now uh, Pavia uh, Digital Library is able to manage a real glam scenario in which uh, the cultural heritage domain can be explored in an integrated way by means of their relationship. And here you can have a sample of the different uh, uh, digital objects uh, that you can find uh, in the Pavia Digital Library. Ancient books, archaeological materials, manuscripts, paintings, ancient prints, administrative documents, uh, together with uh, uh, scientific instrument instruments. And uh, uh, for example, when you start a search uh, within the digital library, looking for example for Ugo Foscolo, an Italian poet belonging to 19th century, uh, you are uh, brought uh, to different kind of uh, cultural digital materials related uh, to, the, to the poet. For example, uh, you can find a portrait uh, um, representing the poet. Uh, you can find the first edition of one of his most famous novel, The Last Letters of Jacopo Ortis. You can find even a stamp representing uh, the poet published in Greece uh, to remember uh, this poet, together with a letter to his mother or uh, some biographical data related uh, to, poet, to the poet's life. And this is possible uh, due to the uh, this space glam uh, extensible and configurable data model, which uh, allows uh, the librarians to relate uh, digital objects uh, with persons, uh, events, uh, places, concepts, projects, fonts, and so on, uh, thus creating uh, relationships among digital objects uh, and providing an overview of artistic production or uh, thematic and historical paths. Uh, the data model allows you, uh, therefore, to explore the historical and geographical context of the digital objects and uh, to define a network or relationship uh, to be discovered, navigated, and studied. On the top of this uh, data model is built another component of this Tevis Glam, uh, the Network Lab. Uh, this tool, by exploiting the links defined at data model level, displays graphs based on the relationships between people, documents, events, and places. In particular, out of box, the space glam is able uh, to display relationships between persons who are co-authors of the same document, were born or died in the same place, or have participated in the same events or in events that took place in the same place. Moreover, other graphs can be defined to display further relationship based on entities or other entities structured, structured within the data model. And here you have an example of such graph uh, focused on 
the uh, dramatist and librettist Eugene Scribe. And you can see that uh, there are two uh, kind of circles around uh, the graph focus. The first one is related to persons who had uh, a direct first level relationship with Eugene Scribe, whereas the second one uh, is related to person who hadn't uh, a direct relationship with uh, the focus of the graph, but however, had a first level uh, direct relationship with uh, persons which in turn had a direct relationship with Eugene Scribe. In this way, scholars uh, are, uh, are able uh, to find out uh, uh, relationship that uh, in some case they haven't noticed it before uh, using a uh, traditional way of studying uh, this kind of historical sources. So uh, to conclude uh, with uh, this space glam, uh, Pavia is moving from a digital library to a real digital humanities platform, able to deeply explore the different cultural resources, relate them with persons, events, places, and other entities, model historical social networks on such relationships, and in other words, they are able to analyze cultural data, highlighting and enhancing their relationship at different scales. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Claudio, that's great. And um, we're gonna move on now to our next speaker, who is Bram Leuten, who's a co-founder of Atmire, who are also a sponsor. So again, really, really great to, to have the sponsors involved uh, here. So. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. This is the Atomium in Brussels, photographed by my grandfather, who is no longer with us. And you can find his photographs freely because they are available in a repository. Have you ever been to Belgium? If not, I can highly recommend a post-COVID visit. We have three official languages in Belgium, Dutch, French, and German. The capital in Brussels is predominantly French speaking. And more than once I struck up a conversation in Brussels, either in Fr English or in French, only to realize five minutes in that both me and my conversation partner are actually native Dutch speaking. Multilanguage is a challenge worth tackling. And it's not only in Belgium, but also in our repository services. I'm indeed co-founder of Admire, and today I want to summarize where we are with tackling the multi-language challenge in the DSpace community. But what is the language challenge exactly in the context of repositories? What are we trying to solve for whom? And it uh, connects with uh, George uh, with Stokes' presentation earlier in this session. The community of submitters and creators, they are the ones who fill your repository. So for them, it should be easy to submit and to accurately describe their content. On the other hand, people and machines who may want to read your content need to be able to find it, the discovery challenge. So part of this finding challenge is that they need to trust your system, which can be hard if the entire interface is only available in a language that they don't understand. And what I found very interesting in the, the proposal earlier that said, let's translate all of the, the different metadata is that I really wonder to which extent a user is served or disappointed if, if these uh, metadata are all translated, but then they find an asset uh, that is ultimately in a language that is a language that they don't understand. I think it's a uh, uh, valuable problem to address. But let's start off with the good news. DSpace has done a pretty good job in situations where the reader audience and the creator audience share the same single language, even if that language is not English. The challenges, both for the creator and the reader audience, they start at the point where a single DSpace installation needs to host content in multiple languages. As a reader, I want to know if the repository serves relevant content in my language. We are trying to ship DSpace 7 with as many completed language catalogs as possible, 
and to turn them on by default to make it sure it's clear to the repository administrators that these catalogs are generally available. However, in general, it's only useful to offer the repository interface, or at least it could be discussed in a particular language, if there is also content in that language to be found. That's why it's also made easy for the repository administrators to disable these catalogs. I do, did say in general, because there are repositories out there with historical content in extinct languages, where it does make sense to offer the interface in languages other than these extinct languages. For example, if you have a lot of content in Latin, um, the same argument doesn't uphold. It's not required then to offer the entire repository interface in Latin. If you want to contribute to the translation of the messages catalog in your language, especially if you don't see your language on the screen right now, you're still more than welcome and please reach out to me or other committers or members of the DSpace community. For creators, it can be a challenge to describe the content in the appropriate language. Already for a very long time, the DSpace data model has been able to store language codes alongside with each individual metadata value. The default configuration of which language code you wish to use repository-wide for all submissions can be changed through configuration. Again, this illustrates how a basic of a feature basically works well for a repository that has content in a single language, even if that language is not English, but is inadequate once you start dealing with content in multiple languages because the language you apply to metadata fields can only be configured like repository-wide for all the metadata. From an SEO and information retrieval perspective, it makes sense to provide item metadata in the same language as the uploaded files. A paper in Spanish should ideally have Spanish metadata in order to maximize the chances that users searching in Spanish will find the item. At the very minimum, future versions of DSpace should allow to store the appropriate language code corresponding with the language of the describing metadata and files. Assuming that most DSpace items have files attached to them in a single language and that the use case the, the main use case will still be that items themselves uh, are not multi-language, taking some uh, edge, edge cases aside. So if you have already tackled, or if you aim to tackle some of the challenges that I discussed today in your own DSpace 7 repository, I would love to learn more and see where me or my colleagues can help you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ram. So lots of really interesting discussions around language and uh, translation. So can we go on then to Adam Viles Moore, um, also from JISC, so we have a few speakers from JISC here, but Adam, Adam specializes in all things PID related. So he's gonna talk about a national PID landscape and beyond. I will do, a soon, there you go, um, as soon as I... Unmute myself. You can see me and how my photo is a lie. Um, sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. Excellent. Um, bum, 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 bum. Oh, I love Zoom and PowerPoint working together in perfect harmony. Yeah, so it's not in presentation mode there. How's that? Joy. Still not in presentation mode. Uh -huh. Hold on one moment. It is for me to see and show. There we go. That's it. Um, and then I've, I've managed to do this um, in under 10 minutes, by the way, just once. How's that? Uh, I think it's still not in. in All right, let's try it again. Try, yeah, I'll share, I'll share again. Useless. This technology is great, isn't it? Did it to me yesterday as well. Um, share screen. Yes. That Way. Is Good start. <laughs> well, given that um, I've managed this in nine minutes, 18 seconds, we'll just crack through, shall we? Hello, I'm Adam Vilesmer, and with all the colleagues um, mentioned there, I'm from JISC. Um, I think I'm one of the people that Tamsin referred to, but I do not have a white shirt or black tie, so I feel kind of really 
letting the side down, but I'll just move past that. Um, I want to talk a bit, and um, I'm closing the session as well, so I really crack on, about um, persistent identifiers, why we should talk about them in a national context, um, what we've done to address that, um, some kind of work we've done on looking at prioritizing the persistent identifiers that are important for that work, um, and where we are right now. So I'm going to start at the very beginning. Um, there's a song about that. Uh, so I used to be a hypertexty person. So the Memex, uh, Zandu, Mother of All Demos, all of these kind of things that are the, like the fundamentals of persistent identification. Um, they all have these ideas about something that's persistent. Um, the infrastructure behind that is guarantees that these things are really long lasting and a unique identifier. And the other thing that's really key is the, the metadata, the kind of the data around and supported by these infrastructures. Um, why do we in the UK, and I would suggest, and um, from the recent RDA session, um, you can see really positively, other nations need to have a think about their persistent identifier infrastructure as well. Um, there's a fair bit being said about persistent identifiers at the moment. Plan S, GoFair, the OECD. Um, in Europe, uh, EOSC all have PIDs uh, kind of at the fundamental uh, level of their policies and their platforms. Um, and it's recognized as they're something that will enable open science, open research, and are a core part of the infrastructure. In the UK, um, and you know, from my job's point of view, uh, Professor Dekel very kindly mentioned us and said that um, we should do stuff. I should also mention that uh, part of my job is to support the National UK Orchid Consortium. So it's nice to see that word in his statement. Right, so what did we do? Well, we started out by looking at, you know, the real world, where things are. This is actually from quite a long time ago now. Um, but where are the persistent identifiers? What are already being supported? Terrible grammar, I'll go over it. Um, but what are the priority pits? What are these things that if we support them um, and work with them, how can uh, that best give us wins in open science, open research, the infrastructure and the workflows around that? So we looked at um, five areas of activity. Um, so ensure that uh, we had equitable access to PIDs, um, there's targeted interventions, uh, benefits analysis, engagement across governance, and, and sustainability. Again, that point, it's really important that these things are not just about quick and easy wins in themselves, but about it improves the sustainability of the infrastructure and the fabric itself. So, you know, what is science? Well, um, this might be slightly leading, but you know, I always say it's a person, they work at a place, they're funded, um, they do projects, that they have outputs and data. And that might be slightly leading because um, I have a diagram which has all of these priority PIDs that we've identified in them that kind of identify those things. Um, for a long time, we kind of went back and forth by talking about funding, a grant P, the a grant PID, the Crossref Funder Registry, but that is actually, of course, just a DOI um, itself. Um, and I should really kind of make that point really clear. So the Crossref Funder Registry just ends up emitting a DOI. So it's another DOI. Um, so we've got these five priority PIDs that are identified on, as I said before, um, um, importance in the community, in the research flows, but also. Um, as well as impact things like sustainability and um, governance. So for funding the, the Crossref um, data site, sorry, Crossref funding <laughs> registry um, for projects RAID, research activity identifier. Um, some people may not be so aware of that, but it's particularly important because you can pull narratives of projects together with it. For organizations ROAR, search organizations registry, for outputs, DOIs, I think we all know probably about them, and for people, ORCID IDs. Um, so what are we doing about this? As I watch the time countdown, well, we've got the RINC, um, which we need a better name for, the Research Identifier National Coordinating Committee for Strategic Insights to liaise, to align PIN integrations. So this is our kind of national body 
that works across stakeholders to coordinate at that level. Um, and that diagram that you've got there sees, um, we of course acknowledge the international context of persistent identifiers and infrastructure, but there is also a place for ensuring that these things are coordinated at a national level as well. Um, we've worked on, again, identifying these workflows. This is a simple Myra, Myra board um, and trying to make sure that we've got the places to ensure we have impact. Um, and we are currently just finishing off the last few bits of cost benefit analysis. So the cost benefit analysis looked at where persistent identifiers currently have or could have impact in the research landscape and try and put some kind of actual cost to that. It will be available on June the 21st. I am fairly confident I can commit to that. Um, and it will give an overview of um, how much we think we can say at a very conservative estimate, PIDs have saved the research community and the potential for increasing that benefit. So, in my time, thank you very much. Thanks, Adam, that's great. So we've uh, come to the end of the presentation. Um, we were supposed to finish at 10.55 to give people a little bit of time, but since we don't actually have a session after directly after us, it's not like people need that little break. So we have one question in the chat, that were, or sorry, the two questions in the chat that were answered, and I've copied the, them into the the document as well, but there's one in the Q&A, which I'll just read out now. Um, this is from Rutger and it says, ORCID is a personal identifier filled out by the researcher. Do you also suppose a need for one that can be assigned such as IS, the ISNI? So, um, as I said, I work in um, the ORCID UK community um, and ISNIs are something that are important for um, identifying non-active people. So the or thing about ORCID is it's a personally owned active identifier and ISNIs are great for things that aren't those people. But for um, personally persistent unique identifiers, ORCID is the best model for that. So we are currently in the UK and working with ORCID looking at tools to allow institutional reporting and analysis and analytics. Um, ISNI as well as ORCID um, for kind of double identifying, I think would make the landscape more complex. And I think there are better solutions looking at opportunities to use ORCID at an institutional and wider reporting level rather than trying to um, revisit ISNI versus ORCID or ISNI plus ORCID. Great, good answer. Um, I think that's very clear. So I, there's no other questions in the chat or in the Q&A. So what we'll do is we'll finish up the session. Um, I'll remind you of where we are, although we don't have a session immediately afterwards, but at one, no, 12, 12 um, UTC, there is a networking session. Please do come along. It's a chance to, to chat to people um, you can wander around by using the Wonder platform. It's a lot of fun and it'll be a chance to uh, have a chat to some of the sponsors. If you were interested in, in the presentations that we had from some of the representatives from the sponsors here today, you might go along and, and have further discussion with them about those. Or if you're interested in, in um, other aspects of their work, please go ahead and, and have, uh, take the opportunity in the networking sessions to have a chat with them. That would be great. And thank you so much to all our speakers and to everybody who joined the session. Thank you, bye. Thank you very thank much you for hosting, time. Catherine. Much appreciated. Thanks. Thanks, so. Thanks, Catherine. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Catherine. Bye.